I'm going to add a caveat to this, which is there, there, there's one place where they have it, and that is at Universal Studios. There, there's the keyring for Transformers the Ride, the keyring for maybe the Simpsons ride, and there's one other, and I can't remember what it is. But but those ones don't count. If you see me and you give me those, I, I'll spit in your face. They do not count. Hello and welcome to another episode of Desert Island Tricks. So another another week, another guest, uh, a really exciting one because I, un- unlike some of the other guests, I don't know this one very well, so I'm very excited to find out what his list consists of. But let's just uh, clue you up onto the concept of the podcast. So the idea is that we are going to maroon our guest on an island. Once again, we're not really doing this. We don't have the budget. Uh, but we are going to send them to an imaginary island. When they're on the island, they're allowed to take eight tricks with them. One book and one non-magic item that they use for magic. Um, particulars like who the audience is and all that sort of stuff, it really doesn't matter. It's basically uh, the tricks that they could not live without. The things that they... If they had to perform them forevermore and nothing more, that's what they would perform. So with that being said, let's get into today's episode. Uh, Today's guest has an incredibly impressive resume. He's an actor and director as well as a magician. He's involved in TV and film projects like Catch-22, A Crook House, uh, A Small Light, Silent Witness, the list goes on and on, as well as being involved with hit West End shows like Ghost Stories and George's Marvelous Medicine. Now in 2012, he became one of the youngest solo stand-up comic acts at the Edinburgh Fringe festival Uh, and then he subsequently had that transferred to the Trafalgar Studios in London uh, which is a lovely theatre uh, to top all of this, he had a he has a series of tricks released to the community under the name Spooky Nyman. That's going to give away who the guess is straight away. Um, most recent, he had a brilliant trick called Discovery from Penguin Magic, which is really, really clever, and I urge you all to check that one out. So today's guest, of course, is Mr. Preston Nyman. Nice to have you on, Preston. Thank you for having me on the first the first ever episode of Desert Island Tricks. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to Do hear I... your list. I'm very very excited. Right. Well, a lot, I have to give an honourable mention first to uh, my dad's tricks. My dad is is a, a man called Andy Nyman, and he's been releasing tricks. Uh, and kind of working in magic for years. And none of his tricks made my list purely because they're too close to home. So I, I, I know them all too well, and I'm nostalgic about all of them because I uh, either remember, like, when um, uh, Killer Elite, the first version, came out, I remember sitting with my sister when we were tiny and, like, packaging them up with Dad. So, like, they've all got a memory for me. So my list would purely just be Dad's tricks unless I just kind of, as a blanket rule, put Dad's tricks to the side. So none of his tricks are on the list, but they all get an honourable mention. Uh, probably uh, Dice Man most of all. But my actual list is a lot of... uh, I'm not a performing magician. I'm I'm a a creator, I suppose. So they're not necessarily based on, like, performance uh, capabilities. They're more just based on great methods and fun stuff, basically. So uh, I mean, do you want do you want to hear the first? Should I just go into it? Uh, yeah, why not? Let's let's go to your um, your island and find <laughs> out what you've got in your first position. Where is the island, by the way? It's important for me to know this. There are, there are no if you if you knew the questions that I've been given by <laughs> magicians of how what's the square footage, uh, how big, how many people are there, are there animals there? Can I survive for whatever your island looks like to you is is fine. Fine. It doesn't affect any of my tricks, I suppose. Uh, so my first, um, my first trick would be Invisible Zone, the uh, Tenyo trick, Invisible Zone, Luba Fiedler. There's a there's a, a couple of uh, Luba Fiedler hits on this list. He is my favourite magician, and I'm very sad that I, I mean I've seen his lecture DVD and various sort of clips and read uh, as many lecture notes of his as are out there. 
but I never got to see him lecture anything, which is uh, definitely a, a sad thing for me. But I think Invisible Zone is quite possibly the possibly the second greatest uh, trick of all time in terms of like pocket tricks or, uh, or or tricks you can buy. And actually, the next one on my list is is another one of his that I think is the greatest trick of all time. But Invisible Zone, if people haven't, I'm always amazed when people haven't seen it. Is do you know it? Have you seen it? I do. So I remember getting. I want to say it was. Uh, it's got to have been a Marvin's magic set when I was younger. Yeah. And I think he, he had uh, the sets where it was drawers and he used to pull them out and they were different colours and each one had an yes. individual trick in. And I think that was the first time that I had Invisible Zone way back then. Um, and I still think I've got my original one kicking about somewhere. Just because just I didn't you know want to throw I it away. I think I have one of the Marvin's ones and I think I have it in the box too. I'm pretty sure that it had the sort of blue tab on it was the colour code. The one. yeah, yeah. Um, I, so so it, Marvin's Tenyo put it out, and then Marvin uh, got a license to put it out, and then it got ripped off a million times, and Tenyo stopped making it. And then recently, very quietly, they started making it again. And I was sort of collecting them over the years. They, they very rarely came up, and when they did, they were, like, insanely expensive. So anyone that was remotely in my budget, I would buy. And so I've, like, taken them apart and played them in different ways. Uh, and, then, and then they put it out, so I ended up buying a bunch of them when they put it out again last year. Invisible Zone is basically a pen, if you haven't seen it, that you push through a sort of case, and the case has a door in it, and you push the door open. It's like a biro pen. You push the door open and the middle of the pen has vanished and there's a spring in its place and you say, that's the invisible zone. And you can take the spring out and there is nothing uh, and you can wave your hand behind it, you can look through. It's the most amazing trick and uh, the method is as satisfying as the trick is in terms of there's, there's so many little things going on that make the illusion so strong. And all the rip-offs that you're able to get would like miss one of those things out. So they'd miss a detail out with the pen or a detail out with the spring or a detail out with something on the case or they'd miss these details out. And the, the tenure or the Marvin's one is the only ones that uh, that actually make it properly. It is so good and it's, and it's as much fun to perform as it is to watch. And there's also, um, there's brilliant stuff where in the in Richard Kaufman's tenuism book, there's a couple of tenure things on my list too, as we'll, we'll we'll get to. But in the tenuism book, there's two great things. One of them is I can't remember. I think it's maybe a Spanish magician. I can't remember his name. Um, who sort of baked it in, baked the the mechanism into a lump of clay, and then puts sort of loose wet clay in the middle of it. So he's made a sort of clay donut that's hard with the with invisible zone inside, and then put new fresh clay in the middle of it before he performs so he does it where it looks like he stabs the pen through a lump of clay and then tears the middle of the clay out and there's the pens vanished so you kind of lose this the sort of slightly weird tenue case which is a great idea it's in tenuism but there's also a brilliant video of luba fiedler doing his prototype version where at the end he goes he, he talks about lots of things get lost in the invisible zone and uh, lots of just like debris and stuff he does the trick and he goes i should uh, i'll clean up afterwards and he's got a dustpan and brush and he goes to sort of sweep up the invisible zone quote unquote and all of a sudden the table is like full of uh cogs and springs and like bits and bobs that he then sweeps up it's it's the most amazing moment and it's so clever how he's doing it uh and so simple but that's in the in the tenuous books there's loads of great stuff around invisible zone but just on its own i think it is the most amazing trick yeah, I remember Stop. when when I saw it when I was really little. Do you know what? I, so the I don't know if the the new ones are like this, but the Marvin's one you could actually pop the door off as well. So when I was little, yeah. I don't know if this is a good idea or not. So don't hate me. Um, but what I would do is I would do it in like a three phase thing. So I'd start with putting the pen through, and then are oh, the springs there? And then I would say, but I bet you think that the spring has something to do with it, so let's pop the spring out. And then I would do it again, and I would open up the door, and I'd say, and now it's gone. And I'd put my finger in and wiggle it about. And then I would say, but I bet you think that something's happening behind the door, so let's take the door off. And I would pop the door off and put it back through again. And they would see the pen disappear for a second and then come out the other end. Um, so I don't know if that's that good. That is great. Um, but... Because of that, I ended up snapping one of the little bits off the door. So it half hangs off of, of my one, but I didn't want to throw it away because I love it so much. So it still exists in its original form, just a bit battered, I think. Well, you can also, like, um, the, I think taking it as part is good. And, and I sort of tried to go, when I when, when I bought a bunch of them, when they bought it out again last year, was it last year or the year before, maybe? I don't know if they still sell it, but I... Um, 
I bought one, one of them I bought to cut apart, because there's a great video on YouTube that someone did. Oh, who is it? It's a guy that posts a lot of sort of cool Tenyo adapted stuff. Can't remember his name. And he's basically done like the, the like walking through the fan illusion, but with a fidget spinner. So he's cut into an invisible zone, put a fidget spinner in and cut a bit of the door out. So he pushes the pen through and then spins the fidget spinner like the, uh, or, or he spins it and then pushes the pen through like it's penetrating through. So with a broken one, you can kind of um, adapt it and still, you could still make it work. The other one that I did, sorry, I'm just rambling about invisible zone now, but the other one I did was kind of as, a, as, as sort of a step further than taking everything apart was I pried one open and took the, it is a mechanical trick and it's so clever. I took the mechanism out and put like copper wire and little bits and bobs around the the inside of the, the kind of case so that I could start the trick by displaying the case, taking the door off, taking the spring out and opening the case up. And it looks like some sort of space age nasa technology thing. Take the case back, switch the case while I look at the door and the spring. So now I've got the gimmicked case, clip the door back onto that one and put the spring back in and then do the trick. I never ended up showing anyone, but it's quite a cool thing if you've got one that's like broken lying around that you want to play with. Um, anyway, that's Invisible Zone. Let's find out what your second item is. So my second item is another Looper Fiedler item. And uh, this, I think, is the greatest trick of all time. And that is the dental dam coin penetration which people generally don't uh know that that's luba fiedler it's one of the most ripped off tricks um and for people that haven't seen it it's a glass with a sheet of rubber like a dental dam um over the top of the glass with a rubber band around it and on top of the dental dam are two coins there's a 10p and a 2p and the spectator picks a coin so say they pick the 10p you uh, you take the 2p off and you take the 10p and you can do it fast, but it's better to do it slow. You sort of slowly visually penetrate it through the rubber dental dam and into the glass and then they can have everything. It's completely sealed. There's no way for the coin to get out. And it has like, it looks like a special effect. It has penetrated through the rubber and you, there's no, um, there's nothing to find at all. And it is the closest, you, you can do it really quickly, but I, I think it ruins, doing it slowly is like, it is honestly like watching a special effect. And I've never seen any um, sort of, I suppose it's a penetration, but it's more visual than that. But I've never seen anything that is as clean and visual, one object passing through another object. There's no cover on it. It's not like you cover the coin and then you uncover it and it's vanished and it's inside the glass. You see it melt through the rubber. And again, I'm amazed by the amount of people that haven't seen this because it's such a knocked off trick. But it was Luba Fiedler in the 60s, I think. I think he found out about it. He was playing, he, he was working in a, um, like a plastics factory, possibly, and uh, was playing r with rubber gloves, his rubber gloves, and, and figured out that there was a sort of property of them that he could use. You just can't get your head around it. And there's also brilliant... Uh, there's a great idea out there where you do it upside. You have a glass full of water with the, the dental dam sealing it. So you do it upside down and inside the glass on top of the dental dam are two coins. And they, and once they've selected the coin, you pull their coin out of the glass. And now you have this, this actual sealed, sealed glass that has their, um, their coin penetrated through it, which again, I've never done. I, I'm a little bit nervous that it would spill water everywhere if it went wrong. Cause it does go wrong every now and then this trick, but, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great idea and there's a lot of good ideas this trick floating around but i think just in its cleanest form there is no th th i don't think i've ever seen anything more like magical in person yeah and it's the fact that i mean arguably dental dam isn't an everyday pro uh, thing but i would say balloons and sheet rubber we've seen stuff like oh, that. yeah so it feels really organic as well just a cup a sheet of rubber and two coins and you can do this unreal thing where you know you can then hand them the glass and they can take it and look at it all they want there's there's literally nothing to find yeah. um it, yeah it's just well, incredible it also lives in that kind of middle i i know what you mean about it not being a or it's i i think a lot of my favorite things i, I think that there, there's sort of too much emphasis a lot of the time on like things being completely everyday objects i think all you have to do is know what 
something is to you as a spectator because i i think otherwise sometimes people especially when they present tenure stuff or that sort of lubefiedlery um method first sort of magic where where you, people end up really over justifying objects i think a lot of the time with pocket magic and actually what you're right about is you can see a glass a rubber band holding the thing down a sheet of rubber and two coins and and yeah a sheet of rubber isn't the most everyday thing but it doesn't need explanation because as a spectator i can recognize what it is and come up with my own story about why you've got it you know i, th- I think when, when people try to when people try to over justify things it's then more suspicious than it's okay to have something that's a little bit weird and i think going back to invisible zone and a lot of the things i've got actually on this list they're slightly weird things but they they make sense to the trick and they don't really require that much of an explanation because you're allowed to have something that's a little bit exciting if you're doing a magic trick it doesn't have to be all chewing gum you know um so i think that there's something intriguing about as a spectator i understand what the properties of rubber are even if i don't necessarily interact interact with like a square of rubber in my everyday life so I, I know enough about it to know that the trick is not possible but not too much about it where i'm like oh well maybe that's a weird sheet of rubber do you know what i mean it, it's a sort of nice middle ground i think yeah i agree um so the the mar- the marketed name i think i have for it is called penetro rubber um i'm not sure whether that's an official version or non that's just the version that i saw when i was little at davenport's um so that's that's how i remember that that specific one did you buy it from davenport oh of course who wouldn't have <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> there's i think uh anyone that ever went to davenport's when when they were young typically had like three or four <laughs> tricks dem to them and everyone had those same three or four tricks <laughs> um, and i definitely think this would have been one of them i think uh, everyone would have bought one after seeing it it's, it's hard not to I think there was a wave of seeing it a lot. And I don't think you see it that much anymore. I mean, I guess Davenport's has gone, but maybe if you went into international, you'd see it. But I, it, it sort of felt like um, you saw it in every magic shop. And I guess as, as more people buy magic online, you sort of don't see it as much. There's another great trick that's demmed to people in international. I don't know if you see, this isn't on my list, but it is an amazing trick. If you go into international, there's a... Um, I can't remember what they call it. I think it's done with dominoes originally. It's a really old trick, a predictor color. It's called something like that. And it's little double-sided colored chips, little plastic chips. And it'll be like red on one side, blue on the other. And they're drops on the table and the spectator like piles them up kind of with the colors touching. So black on black, blue on blue, red on red. But they can start with any chip, end with any chip. And they end up with a pile that has one color on top and one color on the bottom. And it matches your prediction. It's so good. That's not on my list, but just think about tricks that are demmed. That it's really hard not to buy straight afterwards um anyway that's that's my my dental damn spiel but i think that that is is just the most unbelievable trick yeah it's a great choice Uh, and it leads us nicely into your third position what do you have in your third position so this is one of my own tricks if you can believe that surely everyone puts one of their own tricks on the list and it does link to lubefiedler again these are my three sort of lubefiedler things because it is uh inspired by one of his ideas but i put out a trick a couple of years ago called the esp testing set and by the time this uh podcast is out there will be a plastic version which is lovely they're really really nice uh nice plastic stock and they come in a really nice wallet that'll be out uh after we've recorded but before this episode is released and it was based on an idea of his that i found in some lecture notes that like a lot of his stuff was like not a great trick but a great idea and i put quite a lot of work into making it an actual usable trick and i'm really proud with what i came out with so i'm i'm it's on my list because i love the trick i think it's a great trick and it's three stages and the third stage is a guaranteed magician fooler but it's more on my list because of uh I put one trick out before, which I was really proud of, and it's a really sweet trick, but it's it was definitely like dipping my toe into releasing stuff. And this was the first thing that I'd really like put a lot of time into, hit the ground running with it, and uh, was very like proud of the process. So I think in terms of tricks that make me happiest, that's one of them because there's a lot of uh, a lot of time and a lot of thought that's gone into it, and into the original version, but also into the new version. Uh, and it's one of the few things that I've actually performed a lot for people. Again, I don't really perform stuff, so so uh, in the interest of testing it out before I sold it, I ended up doing it quite a lot for people. And so it's one of the tricks that I'm most comfortable uh, with too. So that's on my list, the ESP testing set. 
So it's a set of uh, ESP cards, and uh, there's an extra sort of um, info card that goes on top. And so you have this sort of seven card set, and the first stage is uh, take the cards, put mine in your back, take one out, and don't show me what it is, and I'm going to divine what it is. Um, and it's pretty cool, and it's a, it's inspired by a different, very old thing, very cool, and it's all obviously credited, but very cool trick. But afterwards, you go, look, I'm demonstrating ESP, extrasensory perception. Maybe, 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 maybe I saw a reflection of the card you took out, and I pretended it was ESP, but actually it was just SP, sensory perception. So we're going to do it again. This time, and you change the goalposts, they do it in a different way, and uh, it's a fairer way, seemingly. And you're still able to tell them what it is. But afterwards, you go, you're a skeptic, I can tell. Maybe you think that was also just SP, sensory perception. Maybe the cards sound different or something, you know, and I heard which one you, you removed from the pack, whatever. This time, I'm going to show you the only fair example of ESP that you will ever see, extrasensory perception. They take the cards, they mix them up. Your back is turned. They put one in their pocket. They cover them all up with the, the, the blank card, basically goes on top. They're dropped on the table, you turn around, there is no way that you can know what the card is and you're able to divine what the card is. And it's not multiple, it's the same outcome every time. It is so strong, and it, and it, I've had so much fun showing it to magicians, because every now and then there's been two or three people who've gone, oh, maybe it's that, and got it. But for the most part, you have nothing to... Uh, the stage is built so delicately that by the time you get to the third stage, you 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 sort of have nothing really to grasp onto anymore. And uh, it, it, I've had a lot of fun lecturing it too and kind of asking people afterwards what your theories on it may be. I, I did a thing last year where I interviewed, uh, I edit the magazine for the Young Magicians Club and as part of that I went to a, there's a sort of a, a themed attraction design company called BRC Imagination Arts in, in America. And all the people that work there are people that used to work for Disney Imagineering or Universal Creative, or they're all like proper sort of theme park names. And uh, I went to interview someone there and also give them a talk on magic. And I showed them this. And afterwards, I was like, does anyone have any guess as to how this might work? And they're not, there's a couple of sort of magic adjacent people, but they're not magicians. And what was amazing was seeing, if I do that in a lecture, everyone's guess is based on like, uh practical how could that work as a, genuinely if i was doing a magic trick how would i do that and no one's ever really got it right but it's interesting to hear people's practical guesses and it was amazing talking to sort of theme park designers about it who their guesses were all so far removed from what it was and so sort of wildly out of the box that my method seemed kind of um boring in comparison you know to these methods that weren't restrained by kind of what is actually possible in the magic trick um which is really satisfying but anyway that's that's my third item is my my esp testing set and that brings us to your halfway point so your uh, fourth trick this is actually a couple of tricks on one key ring i'm taking a key ring and i can't decide which trick to put on the key ring but all of these tricks i've chosen for the same reason because they all go on a key ring and again they're, they're some of the few tricks that i've ever actually sort of performed so i would take one set of keys which would have another tenyo here zone infinity which if you haven't seen is is again a weird it's sort of like a coin case you pop a coin in to this sort of rubber case and you slide it into a little plastic box and there's no it's very tight around the coin there's no kind of space for it to move and you take one of the keys on the keyring and push it through the middle of the coin and then out the other end and uh again it's another weird amazing tenure trick but it fits on keys and it's really really satisfying to uh to show people and they can examine there's a really clever way where they can examine it without finding how it works and uh it's it's one of those you just it's really easy to carry around with you as is fair play it is steve haynes and paul harris released it and it's a it's a uh it's a sort of mentalism effect where the prediction is sealed in a key ring and it's a ingenious method and it's a really well-made prop and it's really fooling 
they sold it years ago and then they stopped selling it and you can only get the japanese one online because it's done they've done it in a few different languages and then a couple like maybe two years ago they put it out again but only very briefly and i think now it's quite hard to get again but it, it's one of those i i ended up buying two finding another one on ebay a couple of years after i bought the first one because i love it so much i didn't want to put the first one on my keys in case i lost it or it broke so i was like i've got to find another one so i can stick it on my keys and then the other one can sit in a drawer forever and never to be touched you know that sort of magicians need to buy two of everything um and the third thing that will be on these key rings, which I'm counting as one thing, because it's a set of keys, is flight, which I think is Steve Thompson. And um, it, I, I'm, I'm, there's, uh, I, this is a bit of a conflicting one for me. There's, there's companies I prefer buying tricks from, and companies that I am not as enthusiastic about buying tricks from. And um, flight was a trick where I was like, I really like the method, but I'm not necessarily sure if I want to throw my money in a certain direction. And uh, so I, I didn't buy it for ages. And then I had an idea for a trick. Tom Brace used to organize this night called Magic Roulette. It was a great night in London once a month where it was a new material night for magicians. that kind of had a loose theme every time, but, but not really. And he asked me to do it. And I was like, I, I don't really ever show people tricks but maybe actually I've, I've got a couple of ideas i'd like to try and one of them was a uh it was a um Quran's medallion but with th there's that brilliant joke in the simpsons where they go to crusty land and bart's looking for the custom key ring that has his name on it and they don't have bart but they have bought and it's like a running joke in the episode and that is my experience going to gift shops or theme parks or whatever anytime they have stuff with names on it they never have my name so i was like it'd be really funny to do a Quran's medallion but with a key ring like a like a gift shop key ring that has people's names on it find the weirdest name in the room and it's predicted on a uh on a on a key ring i thought it was a really funny idea and uh i played with a million different methods that were like things that attached to things or things that could be printed onto the, or whatever. It was just, it was so complicated and so nerve wracking. And I came back to flight cause I was like, it's a brilliant method, but I don't think it's the best method for the trick that they sell it. They sell it for a, a um, ring flight. And I think that it, it, it's a way more versatile gimmick than that. So I would, I would definitely recommend it, but I, I, I think for a ring flight, it's, it's a little bit weird, but it's a brilliant, brilliant idea. Just not quite for that trick. I don't think. So that would be, I would take a key ring with those three tricks on. So even though I was stranded on a desert Island, I could pretend that they were my house keys and uh, no one would know. I suppose <laughs> they can be your hut keys. Um, exactly. They can be my hut keys. Yes. So it, there's, there's a couple of things off the back of that. Number one, Listeners, your job is to go to local gift shops by you, find the section with names on, and if anyone finds Preston, you must purchase it, keep it, and when you see <laughs> Preston at a convention or at an event, you have to give it to him. Uh, we, I'm determined now to find things with Preston on. I'm going to add a caveat to this, which is there, there, there's one place where they have it, where they, there's one place where I found Preston and that is at Universal Studios that there, there's the keyring for Transformers the ride the keyring for maybe the Simpsons ride and there's one other and I can't remember what it is have Preston it's so weird and I bought them every time I see them I'm like I've got a bike because it's got my name on it but but those ones don't count if you see me and you give me those I, I'll spit in your face they do not count <laughs> um, but any anything else that has Preston on it I'll accept but those two is like I've got that's old news to me but I'll, I'll accept that if anyone wants to buy something that has the word Preston on it so there we go that that is our challenge to find things with uh, Preston on um here's the second thing so all the way through this podcast I have been devil's advocate. Therefore, wow. being devil's advocate, you have zone infinity, fair play, and flight. You are only allowed to take one of them. From that set of three, if you had to choose just one of them, which one would you take with you? Flight is great, but I would only use it for the... Currently, I would only use it for that stage routine that I did, so not flight. Zone infinity is great, but it's not as good as invisible zone. I've already got a tenure thing and I've got another tenure thing coming up. Fair play is the most different to anything else I'm taking to the island and possibly the, uh, I mean, th th oh, there are three very fun methods, but fair play is an incredibly fun method. Um, so it would have to be fair play. 
Amazing. See, playing devil's advocate has its uh, has its advantages. Um, you forced me to whittle it down. I respect you for that. <laughs> but they're all great, great tricks. Um, I remember seeing Flight for the first time and thinking, wow, that's just so incredibly clever. Um, and it was very unlike anything that had been around before it in that genre of trick. Yeah. There had been there was a thing by Nick Einhorn which was really cool and really clever. Um, but uh, flight for me was just a revelation of, of a method. I thought it was so clever and so superb. There's a, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a Steve Deshek thing that's in one of his books from years ago. That is a similar, I, I mean, I'm a huge Steve Deshek fan. So this is, you know, I can't believe it's coming out of my mouth. It's a similar idea, but it's not as good. That there, there, there are issues with it that flight really solves and they're not it's not that they're very different but the they live in a similar world and the steve de thing is clever but it's just not there's just an additional thing to it that makes it a little bit more cumbersome whereas flight is it's really refined it's a really clever idea you can't quite even when you know how it works you still take a minute of like oh you, if you look at it you can't quite understand it until you're actually just doing it um but yeah it's a brilliant method I, they did a, a brilliant job with it actually uh, and I'm, I'm very glad I used it. My 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 theme park, uh, my uh, keyring routine, I, I published also in in my magazine, Mazel Magazine. So if you want a, a fun use for flight, then take a look at Mazel Magazine because it is in there. Amazing. Uh, and that takes us over the halfway point. So now we're on number five. What's in your fifth position? My fifth position is a Thought Transmitter Pro. Um, and not because it is the best peak wallet, because it's not, and not because it is usable. But, oh, no, actually, that's not fair. I think it is probably usable in the right circumstance. Actually, I take that back. It's completely usable. You just have to be very careful with um, the what's around you when you use it. But it's, I'm a big John Cornelius fan. He lives in, they're my three, Luba Fiedler, John Cornelius, Steve Deshek, and my, like, three big kind of, I'm a big fan of, and... I think it's another example of the most. I, I like anything that plays with not not to sort of talk too much about the the intricacies of it, but anything that plays with color, combinations of color, uh, the properties of materials, properties of lights, and all three of them kind of deal with those things quite a lot in their work. But but Thor Transmitter Pro is for the right circumstance re re definitely usable but is a, just everything on my list basically is another one of those tricks where when you see it you can't stop um i'm literally miming the method now i'm glad this isn't a video thing because i'm literally like it's impossible to talk about the trick without miming doing <laughs> something but it's so satisfying and you feel like a spy when you do it and it's a brilliant bit of thinking because it could have just been there's kind of a, a, a layer of something involved and rather than it just being one layer it's two layers working in conjunction with something else going on that there's a lot of really clever sort of uh color thinking going on and uh how to hide and reveal information in in a in a way that you that is unlike anything else so uh I, i've never performed it i have no intention of performing it but as a as an idea and seeing an idea from like oh i wonder if that would work all the way through to, to selling it uh, it's definitely worth looking at. I don't know what Murphy's put it out again last year, and I remember hearing that that one was a, there, there was something weird with the gluing or something. It, it wasn't quite right. I never interacted with it, but if you can get one of the actual John Cornelius ones from the nineties, I guess uh, they're great. It, it's, it's really worth trying to. But I, I don't know what the Murphy's one is like. I can't talk with authority about that. I just remember hearing it wasn't great, but the original ones are great, really well made, and really, really satisfying. And it's the Pro Thought Transmitter Pro is the the refined version. So I have the original Thought Transmitter, like original, original from from Yonks. Wow. Um, and I loved it. I just think it's another one. It's the method's so clever. And I know you mentioned so cool. about like being, I, I suppose, thinking of a normal wallet, you have to be careful of, of where you're stood 
in conjunction to your spectators. Um, and surely yes. you have that with Thought Transmitter. The only difference is I think there are certain conditions that Thought Transmitter has to be used in. But that being yes. said, I gigged it when I when I first got into gigging um, and I took Thought Transmitter with me and I never had a problem with it. It was so oh, really? superb. Um, and I, I'm sure, and listeners, you'll have to correct me if i'm wrong no doubt everyone will anyway um i'm sure the original had like this plastic card that came with it that you're supposed to have in the back which had like symbols and stuff for them to choose from and then you would take that out and that would give you a reason to access what you needed to access in order to see what you needed to see oh good but the method was so good anyway i doubt anyone ever had the card in it Uh, i don't it, it was so deceptive you could hand the 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 actual device oh to God, people yeah. they would never see it it's just superb well that's what's so is it's so clean and one, well, as soon as you've done the sort of dirty work it can be that there's nothing to see but again that's because it i like that the thinking went beyond um it's really hard to talk about this without kind of giving away if you had that idea you'd think well i could put one layer of something where i need it to be and it will probably work, but it doesn't work because for various reasons that you'll know if you've if you've played with the prop, you have to have this other layer there too, that uh, an actual physical layer. I'm not making any sense if you haven't played with it, but if, if you've played with it, I'm making sense. It, it's such a brilliant way to see through a thought and actually put the work into like refining a thought that the version that exists, you absolutely can just put it down on the table and there's no there's nothing weird about it really other than it's just like... A black wallet so so i think the the reason it's so viewable is because he didn't stop the idea early he, he saw it through i think mm-hmm. yeah i think it's uh it's a tremendous version of that trick um i do think that the, there have been versions that have been released further on in in the development of magic um, which use a different kind of thing yes. where you could see from one position but not from another. But I don't think it's as good because what was great about the thought transmitter is you could literally throw it on the table. You could put it in their hands. You could put it in your pocket. You could have oh it God, anywhere. Yeah. Whereas uh, with the the other kind of thing that's more common nowadays... Um, Yes. There, there are so many more contributing factors about where you stand and the lighting, and you know uh, the 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 thickness of it and the darkness of it, and it's just a, a nightmare. Well, I think also what happened with that other thing you're talking about is the first one was a was a great, really fun to play with and actually usable. I think the the, the very first one of those that got released, and since then the material that was used in the first one has become way harder to obtain and a much cheaper weirder version sort of more commercial version rather than an industrial version is used now and it's nowhere near as good and but people still release stuff using it so i i've got a thing that's been in the works with the company for a while that hasn't come out and will possibly not come out because unless it is that thing that was used originally it's not workable, I don't think. It, it's too uh, it's too risky with different lights and different environments. The the, the more sort of um, commercial version of it that you can buy, you need that industrial version. Otherwise, it's not. It, it's just it's just a method, and it's not a workable trick at all. Is that making any sense? Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. Um, I mean, some people, this is all going to seem really bizarre anyway, um, if they've got no yeah. idea what the trick or or the subsequent thing is. But I think most people will have a, a decent idea of what we're on about, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think if you can still, I, I'm pretty sure you can still get it with these sort of original material. If you can if you can find that trick, I mean, I don't know if we're so deep in whether I can say the name of that trick now, but if you can find a good science method wallet then then do because the the first one is good but since then it's it's not so good (laughs) 
Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to let you know about all the exciting things happening here at Alakazam Magic. We have brand new releases every single month and live streams every Tuesday, so there's so much content to dive into. We ship every single day. If you're in the UK and your order goes to over £40, we ship it to you for free. If you're international and your order amounts to over £70, we ship it for free, fully tracked. And if you live in the United States, we get it sent from our California branch, which means you have cheaper shipping, faster shipping, and no import duties. Can't get any better than that. Honestly, there's so much to discover here at Alakazam, including the monthly newsletter we've all ordered. We have our own live academy where the world's biggest names in magic teach the best tricks in the world. And it's live, so you can interact and ask any questions you like. We have so many exciting things happening here at Alakazam, so make sure you follow us on all social media, Facebook and Instagram, to find out the latest news. Cheers, guys, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. So that takes us swiftly on to position number six. What do you have in your sixth position? This is my last tenure item on the list. I'm a big tenure fan, as you can tell. I think also because my, my interests are in creative methods, tenure is consistently hitting it out of the park. There's a couple, again, like magical MRI, I think is amazing. It's not on my list, but like there's a couple of really creative, weird methods that you just don't see elsewhere. But I've gone for a classic, which again, a lot of people don't know is tenure dice bomb it's again so ripped off you even get it in christmas crackers you get tiny versions of it in a christmas cracker now but it's like a little sort of uh sort of stationary pot and you've got a dice in it and you shake the pot and that one dice turns into eight mini dice inexplicably again there's ways of making it more not in in tenuous and there's a good thing where it is like you um you kind of cover the gimmick in paper clips and it turns into something else. It's it's meant to look like a sort of office stationary pot. I had an idea a couple of years ago of doing one that was like a um it was like a pile of Lego and you shook it and it turned into a it it assembled itself into like a rocket ship or something. There's definitely things you can do. I think someone's got a Rubik's Cube one out maybe that turns I can't remember what it turned into. Marvin's released a Rubik's Cube set, I think. And there's one in a Rubik's yes. Cube set. So I think it's like a small Rubik's Cube that splits into small squares right. or something like that. I think the original is kind of untouchable for me. Again, because it, it defies explanation. And there's no reason to have that dice in that pot. Maybe you could say it's from like a board game. But really and truly, that it's just a magic trick. And it's so good and it's so much fun. But it was also one of the first tricks i got the, the first couple of tricks i got with the rob bromley vanishing deck which dad bought me from davenport which i think is phenomenal still again so ripped off but it's an amazing trick dice bomb i think it was the marvin's version i had i don't think i've ever actually had the tenure version but the marvin's version was very nice uh a, a dog pan with the foam the goshman cake in it and uh zigzag card i got i got zigzag card from disneyland the magic shop at disneyland we went to disney and i got given the the zigzag card at the end of the day at the rainforest cafe those were the tricks i had when i was like tiny but there's a video of me doing dice bomb in our living room when i'm like four years old or whatever uh so so i think it's a brilliant trick but it's also a trick i'm hugely nostalgic about because it is uh it, it it's the first sort of trick that I really remember like doing for people. So that would definitely for, for nostalgic reasons. And also cause it's a great trick. Come on desert Island. Okay. And I think if you've got the Marvin's one, the same one that I had again, it was the same drawers. So it came yeah. it, with a draw with the, the pot inside uh, with a different colored totally. half moon. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was all that sort of collection of clever tricks. What's so sad about that? I loved that packaging so much. I've got a, a very good friend of mine, Andy Room, is uh, a, a excellent uh, magician and theatre director. He's, he's a member of the circle. He's great, and he we speak about those Marvin's boxes quite a lot. And wanting the two things that I really wanted to collect when I was younger were those Marvin's boxes because uh, they're such a lovely, they're sort of matte black finish and all the uh, uniform size. There was the sort of mental epic board one, and they were a really good range. But there was also non magic. Do you remember the Mr. Bean videos? And at the beginning of the video, he'd go, uh, you can see more of my adventures, whatever. He'd like talk about his videos. And each one was, it, 
was like a sort of different colour, but it was him like standing in that spotlight on the front of each video. And those are the two things when I was younger that I really, really wanted to collect, like the Marvin's Magic Tricks and all the Mr. Bean videos I wanted a collection of. Um, a slight tangent there, but we, we speak about that, those Marvin's packages quite a lot, kind of in, in terms of what we sort of really wanted to collect when we were young. The sad thing is, I was a Marvin's dem a couple of years ago, and the packaging still, as I contribute to that old packaging, has the little coloured notch on it. It doesn't, it's completely different shape and everything in the packaging. But it really, really made me sad seeing the packaging now, which is a cool design, but not as... It, it was so exciting, the idea that the packaging was also a magic trick. And uh, it's a shame that it isn't still that, because I think that packaging is unbeatable. But yeah, it, I don't have that packaging still, but it would have come in that box 100%. Because it was that lovely matte finish, it sort of slid really nicely open the box. Yeah. That sort of cardboard insert. I really miss that, actually. But the, the actual boxes were um, tricks in themselves, weren't they? So you could make the trick inside appear and disappear. So each, oh, yeah, each it one, you, it would show an empty box. You'd close it, you'd snap your fingers. When you open it back up, suddenly your trick was inside there. So the actual box itself was a trick. It's so brilliant. It's such a brilliant idea. I think a bunch of mine probably, uh, I think my fingers were too small to ever actually do the sort of draw box uh, trick. So I think a bunch of mine probably I just sort of like pulled open until they kind of came open. Um, but but definitely the, the Invisible Zone one, the packaging is still intact. It was, it was brilliant, brilliant packaging and I, I hope they bring it back one day. Well, it's a very, very good choice. Dice Bomb is a great uh, choice. And again, if you haven't seen it, go and see it. It's it's a great little trick. Um, and that brings us into our seventh position. What do you have at number seven? So this was another trick. Uh, as I started to get more, like, this is a trick I'm very nostalgic about, but it's also a trick that no one knows. And it's so good. And I'm amazed that it's not more of a kind of worker thing. Uh, but when, when I was probably in like year five or six and was like going to conventions with dad and getting more into magic beyond just like having magic sets. I got two tricks and one of them was, uh, I think it was called the stolen deck of cards, which was Gemini twins. Oh no, it was actually sort of the kick more than Gemini twins, but with a sort of a deck of cards where each card had come from a different Las Vegas casino, really cool looking trick. Um, but the other trick I got, which is the one that's on my list, is a trick called Lone Stranger by Paul Richards. So Paul Richards is what he's lecturing at Blackpool, or possibly when this comes out, has lectured at Blackpool. And it will be brilliant. He's uh, he's at Blackpool and he was at Magic Live too. I think he's at Magic Live every year. He's, he's one of those people that I think is so sort of uh, underappreciated. You can go to his stand for easily 45 minutes and just watch every trick and he does these like bundles so you end up buying a ton of stuff everything is so practical so well made so well thought through there's not one thing on his stand actually that i don't think is good it, it's all great stuff and he's so nice and um good the stuff that it's very easy to kind of bypass and actually it, it, it's really really worth looking if you pass a stand go and see his lecture to his stuff's brilliant but lone stranger is great i don't know why a dad must have got it for me i don't know why i had it and it's a red deck of cards with a blue card on top and you spread through the the deck and you say tap tap one of the, the red cards they tap one free choice you take it out and it matches the blue card on top of the deck like a perfect match every time and it resets within the trick it, it's like immediately reset it's so simple and it's so good and i think also i um i have a i i i, I have an issue with the uh i don't mind invisible deck so much when people do that i understand it's a great trick i feel like it's overdone but it is a good trick but i watch a lot of exams at the magic circle and there was a time a couple of months ago. I mean, basically every time that there's an exams night, at least one person will do Ambitious Card. There was one that I saw a couple of months ago that there were four examinees and all four of them did Ambitious Card with the same beats. That to me, I mean, I'm, I'm going off on a slight tangent here, but it does come back around to this trick. That should be an instant fail to me. I'm very diplomatic with that. Like, I, I think most people that try for the circle should absolutely get into the circle. It shouldn't be that hard to get into. I think it's lovely that people can, you know, everyone can take a swing at it. I think if you do ambitious card, you should not get into the circle in your exam because it shows that you're not like, that's the first trick that anyone learns if they're getting into magic, really. And it shows that you, you're you not looking beyond 
you're not pushing yourself hard at all. And I, you could be a terrible magician, but if you were pushing yourself to find new and interesting material or material that fit you or wasn't just page one, then then I think you should be a member. But, but I think that people get really, really lazy by doing versions of Ambitious Card, but ultimately just Ambitious Card. And every week I sit there thinking, there's got to be other tricks. I understand for a lay audience, Ambitious Card is great and they kind of want to see that trick anyway. Totally fine. But if you were like... If you if you're given free reign all the tricks that exist in the world to do a sort of opening thing with cards that was really direct, really easy to understand what the trick was, there's so many other options than ambitious card, and it's so frustrating that that's where everyone stops. And Lone Stranger to me is one of those tricks where I'm like, if I couldn't, if you couldn't do ambitious card, but you had to fill that ambitious card gap with something, what would you do? And for me, it would be Lone Stranger because it is so quick and so direct and so fooling. And it and it ticks that same box as like you've got to do a card thing to get into another set maybe, but but I think that people should not people should throw out ambitious card because it's everyone's seen it it's boring and it's lazy to do that and go and find Lone Stranger by Paul Richards because it is so it, you'll save time doing it too because it's it's like one thing it's so good and it's so quick and so clean that that I think it's a great uh, a, a great opener. I don't even know if he still sells it. I hope he does. If he's if he's selling it at Blackpool, I'll buy another one so I can put it in my drawer. But like, I uh, if if he's not selling it, I wonder if he does it as lecture notes or something. It, it it's brilliant. So find it in some way if he's not selling it. And that brings us on to your final your final choice, number eight. What did you put in your yes. final position? It's not a trick, but it is magic adjacent. Ooh. I am a huge fan of um, props, clown props, comedy props, magic props, uh, props. I love props. And this is, I got one of these a couple of years ago, um, sort of inadvertently ended up with one. And it's, my flat is full of magic books and tricks and gimmicky things, you know, as are all of our homes. And my girlfriend, Emily, she's she's pretty understanding and pretty good at, like, allowing me to have space to just put all my nonsense. This is the only thing where she's been like, I will not have this in the flat. So we, I have a storage unit for the convention me and dad organised, and it sits in there. Uh, but I, I don't understand why. It's it, I think this is the one of the funniest props ever, and it's really hard to find what the history of it is. And I've looked and... and I, can, I can find little bits about the history of it, but not the, not the actual history of it. And that is the comedy bar stool prop. It drops, and uh, it, when you stand up, there's a spike sticking out of the, the seat of the stool. The implication being the sort of middle, the central rod of the stool, the stool's broken, a screw's come loose, or whatever it is, which has made the seat drop, and the, the pole has gone up your bum. This to me is one of the funniest things you can do on stage. I, I've never, I, I've seen it actually a couple of months ago performed so badly by somebody who, he, I'm not naming names, he, they're not magician. The most unbelievably inept performer. It was a terrible performance and still it played huge. It is impossible for that not to play huge. I think it is the funniest, it's such a nonsense idea. Um, but but I, it it never 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 fails to make me laugh, and I and I saw this this performer that I just did not rate at all was sitting there with my girlfriend. He did this bar stool. It played really big, and I turned to her and I was like, "How can you tell me that I am not allowed to have that in the flat? Listen to this reaction this is getting. How am I not allowed to have this in my home?" Um, so it's in a storage unit. One day I'll use it for something. I had an idea to use it a couple of years ago, and it just didn't end up happening. But um. I think that it is just an absolute, it's the sort of thing that you'd end up, you'd sort of think, oh, wouldn't that be funny if I could, if I had like a fake bar stool that made it look like it had gone up my bum and, and never do anything with it. And I love that somebody believed in that idea enough to make it. There's a great, the, the, the really expensive one, I think is the Dick Stoner stool. And it, I, my understanding is that it, I think it's the Dick Stoner stool that has this, has a detonator, like a snappy gum detonator underneath or, or something like that. And uh, and you put a cap in it, so as it drops, it bangs too, which is a really funny idea. But I've I've never played with that. But um, that is the last, maybe a waste of an item on my desert island. But I, I think that just in terms of sheer laughs, you you cannot get funnier than that prop. It's it's had a resurgence recently on social media as well because 
it is a a normal everyday prop which could fit into most yeah. most places so um obviously being put into a uh a barber's or a uh restaurant or somewhere where there, there are unsuspecting victims in the background um it plays quite well that way as well as as like a prank oh. I'm, it is impossible for it not to be funny. I had an idea. Again, I, I'm 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 tipping too many ideas here, but um, uh, this year I'm going to try and get this made. Last year I had an idea, to, or maybe two years ago I had an idea to do it, and then was like, I need to learn something before I do this. But my my aim is to learn how to unicycle and get one built into a unicycle so I can unicycle stop. And as I stop to say, what did you think of my unicycling? I can drop and the unicycle goes on my bum. So I, I'm, I'm going to try and get it made this year. Uh, but God knows how you'd make that. Um, so it's one that we may not get from anyone else either. So it's, it's interesting. It's good. Um, right. And that brings us on to your final two. Now, arguably, these are the two hardest things because you only have one each of them. Um, so what did you put in your book position? I think uh, uh, there, there were four options for me and I, I, had, I landed on one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a very quick four to one. So, so the, the, the three that didn't make the cut, I'm obsessed with 3D. I think 3D is uh, one of the best like optical illusions ever. And I think it's so tied to magic. It's such an amazing way to use our senses against us to, to create a kind of illusion. I think it's completely tied in with magic. We made this 3D film at the convent at our convention last year that was like uh, very silly. But there's a book called 3D Revolution by Rayzone that's a lot of 3D filmmakers and DPs talking about kind of trial and error with he he's, he's a was a 3D historian speaking to a lot of people about trial and error of pushing the boundaries of 3D and it's incredibly inspiring if you have any interest in filmmaking adjacent to magic or 3D adjacent to magic it's really interesting hearing people again just trial and error and just pursuing ideas and and kind of believing in ideas and knowing when to capitalize on them it's a really interesting but really useful book i think for me the second one is the imagineering story leslie i works it's the tie into the disney plus series the imagineering story and similarly it's about imagineers who if you don't know like built the disney theme parks basically it's the, the division that, that creates rides and attractions for disney and the, the book is quite a weird one the series is amazing and the book is amazing there's a couple of weirdly errors in it that aren't it, it's an incredibly well researched book and, and it's an official like disney book but there's a couple of things in it that are weirdly misprinted so so don't take some of it with a pinch of salt but it is another amazing book about trial and error and believing in ideas and pushing past what you think is possible not in a kind of you know um stephen bartlett like de self-development way but, but in a kind of practical way uh th so th those are good but they wouldn't come with me there's a book, Henny Youngman, 10,000 one-liners, which I'm about 7,000 one-liners into. In the same way as the comedy bar stool, I'm like, uh, I just love gags. I love jokes. And these are all just, he, he's like a sort of cat skills comic and long dead, but the, these brilliant kind of one-liners. Some of them are absolutely appalling, but there's at least one on every page. You're like, oh, that's great. And you highlight it. So, so for, for sheer laughs alone, I would bring that with me. It's another thing my girlfriend hates having in the flat because she knows when I'm reading it. So I'll call through and basically say, do you think this is funny? <laughs> and read something out. But the book that I would take is Tom Sellers' Best Sellers, which Supreme put out. And you could for a while get it through my website. I started, I don't really stock anything that isn't mine, but I started stocking it because I was like, this is the best magic book of all time i think and no one knows it tom sellers invented bank night for what it's worth scottish magician uh long 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 dead supreme put this book out in the 70s maybe early 70s that is a collection of basically all of his work and there's really technical intricate stuff combined with really fun creative methods it's, it's a brilliant mix and there's a lot of just here's an idea here's an idea here's an idea loads of ideas packed into this book um it, they've got it in the magic circle library you can get them they'll probably be in stock on my website again soon i think it is the greatest magic book of all time just for sheer like amount of ideas and the inspiration where you go oh well that obviously was written in 
1940, but what if I did that with this instead? You know, there's a lot that could be updated in it. So that's probably my, my the book I would take, bestsellers. And that brings us on to your final thing. Uh, it's normally the most curve bullish out of all of them because I'm never sure where it's going to go. Uh, what is the item that you chose to take with you? When I was really young and uh, dad was working on the Darren stuff with Objective, they had the quick trick show out and they also had monkey magic that, that uh, dad did some work on. And they're largely lost to both those shows, but I absolutely loved them. And I managed to get dad got me from objective like transmission tapes that have the sort of time code on and stuff uh, of both of those shows. So I've got the first series of monkey magic and I've got maybe like series seven of the quick trick show on video. And uh, those are very, very special to me. Even if I didn't have a video player, I those are those were possible options where I could take those just for sheer kind of nostalgia. They're shows I love and they're very happy memories of like watching those videos. Notepad and pen, obviously you take because you want to doodle stuff down or whatever, but that, that's a given. You'd want a notepad and pen. I think the thing I would take with me that's a sort of magic object. Me and dad organized this convention, which I mentioned, the London Magic Convention. And this year we uh we, we love having merch. We love that we've got like our LMC gift shop and we did challenge coins, LMC challenge coins, which is a brilliant kind of challenge coin game. If you don't know it, then look it up. It's a great it's a sort of military game uh, that if you if you have the coin, you're kind of entered into this game. But they're really beautiful, heavy coins and they've got our logo on. They've got a little slogan. They're, they're really, really nice. I'm incredibly happy with how they turned out. So I would take that a because it's a really fun, heavy thing to fiddle with, but also because I'm immensely, it was our third year and it was our best one yet that we did the coins. It was last November. And and so like proud of what we've done with it that I think that that would be the thing I would take with me uh, just for sheer like, I can't believe we've done it, I think. I've, I've always thought there should be like, you know, uh, Blue Peter, everyone wants a Blue Peter badge, but you can only get a Blue oh, yeah. Peter badge if you've been on Blue Peter. I've always wanted there yeah. to be like a, a convention that has a convention badge where you only get the badge if you've been involved in the convention. Um, I that think that would be a cool. great idea. That is a very cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. You want it to be as uh, iconic as the Blue Peter badge, definitely. But that was a great, uh, yeah, great choice and a great list overall. Really diverse. It's not Thank one that you. I would have thought of. Um, if people want to find out more about you uh, and about the London Magic Convention and, and everything else, where are they going to go to? So if you want to find out more about me, go to uh, Mazel Magazine, M-A-Z-E-L Magazine dot co dot UK. And all of my products uh, are for sale there, including back issues of the magazine itself, which is on hiatus. It will come back at some point, but uh, the back issues are full of like interviews and tricks, really, really fun, nice reads. And all of my stuff's for sale on there. Some of Dad's stuff's for sale on there too. Uh, definitely take a look at that. If you want to book for the London Magic Convention, we don't uh, have an official date, but it will be November 2024 will be the next one most likely at the Lyric Theatre Hammersmith where it's been for the last two years go to londonmagicconvention.co.uk um, on Instagram I think I'm at preston.nyman on Instagram because I, I got it because someone had made an account to me even though they weren't me so I sort of gave in and did a, a, a sort of public Instagram but I never really post on it but you can follow me there um, I'll, I'll be posting about I've got something exciting sort of coming up later in the year not magic but you, you can see uh, I'll be posting about that in the next couple of months um so yeah that's probably the only place you can find me but definitely go to mazel magazine m-a-z-e-l magazine.co.uk and buy as much stuff as you want <laughs> and do check out the magazines they're very very good but thank you so much preston it's been great hearing your list uh, we do have your dad coming on at some point to record his as well and hopefully you're going to have an influx of people buying preston um, merchandise and sending it your way as well. <laughs> I know I certainly will be looking. Every Clinton's I go into, every WH Smith, I'll be looking for anything with names on. Please, I'll be delighted to find it, please. Amazing. And thank you everyone for listening as well. Uh, we will hear from you again on another episode of Desert Island Tricks. Bye-bye.
Hi, Peter Nardi here, and I really hope you enjoyed that podcast. I just wanted to make you know that Alakazam have their own app. You can download it from the App Store or the Google Play Store. By downloading the app, it will make your shopping experience even slicker at Alakazam. You'll also get exclusive in-app offers and in-app live streams. So go download it now, and we'll see you on the next podcast.